so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're going to sing about his love for us today. Let's sing together. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. through uh, the message today, but uh, we already heard Charlie sing about God's great love. But I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, and it says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek him let's pray together father you tell us it's totally impossible uh, to live without faith and father because of your great love you gave us this faith and father when we look at us having faith uh, we can put our faith in you because 
you died for us. You gave yourself for us. And because of your great love, you showed us that we can have faith. So Father, we're not trusting in ourselves to be, be pleased by you. It's not what we do. It's what you already have done. And Father, you tell us to love you and serve you and depend on you and you will bless us. Even in Matthew 6.33, it says, seek you, the first, seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and he will add all these things to us. Father, you want to add things to our lives. You want to add faith. You want to add love. You want to add service in our lives. And we're, we're thankful for that. So Father, today and from now on, help us live by faith and not by ourselves. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Baptist Church of McDonough. Today we began a brand new sermon series entitled Love, Life, Live. And today the message takes us to Luke chapter 15. I want to invite you to turn there with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter. If you recall, Luke was a first century doctor. As crude as his instruments and his medicine might have been in that day, he was well respected in society. And he had an encounter with Jesus through some of the disciples. And so he began to write a story of the life of Jesus. And we discover that in the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. He went on to write once again to his friend Theophilus a story of the very first church and how Jesus' church began uh, after Christ's ascension to the throne of heaven. And so it's an interesting uh, take on Luke, knowing that he was not a personal follower of Jesus while he was living, yet he took eyewitness reports from people like Mary, Jesus' mother, Simon Peter, and some of the other original disciples, and then put them into a gospel format, a, a life story with a purpose of telling a truth. That's what a gospel is. Uh, let me, but let me ask you this, because this is where our message takes us. Have you ever really wondered what God is like? And some people think that's the most important question in life. Do you believe in God? And while that is an incredibly important question and very well may be the most important question, what about this one? What kind of God are you believing in? Maybe there's something worse than calling oneself an atheist. Like maybe believing in a God built upon an erroneous, false conception of God. You know, there are many religions in the world that present many differing pictures of God. And they all may contain, I'm sure they do, some element of truth to them. For even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? However, most of the time... They can give you very misleading information and how in the world can you build upon a faulty foundation and hope to finish the project. You can believe in God, but if you have a false conception of God, you may be no better off in the end than an atheist. So what is God really like? Well, Jesus Christ, the scripture tells us, is God in human flesh. Isn't that incredible? I love that movie Contact. The protagonist, played by Jodie Foster, uh, is given this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to travel on this spaceship that is dropped into a wormhole that leads her to another world where she has the very first contact with an intelligent species beyond planet Earth. I love the way they portrayed it. They did very interestingly with the camera work on it, but these very intelligent beings who look absolutely nothing like us fashion themselves into human form and appear to Jodie Foster, this protagonist in the film, uh, as her father, her dead father. 
capturing for her a very emotional experience as well as a very in enlightening experience. Well, that's just the stuff of Hollywood, make-believe, out of the mind of Carl Sagan himself. But the Bible is very clear that Jesus is not just another man. He was not just a great preacher or prophet, first century rabbi. Jesus is God in human form, human flesh. And so God reveals himself to us through Jesus. And the passage we're going to read today in Luke chapter 15 is what is called a doubly significant passage. Now, I don't want to confuse you. All of the word of God is, is very significant. Now, some of you probably uh, very naturally put a lot of weight into the red letter part of the Bible, if you have a red letter Bible which are the words of Jesus in a red letter Bible. The words of Jesus are all found in red ink. That's incredibly important. If Jesus is saying something, you and I better be listening. He's God in human flesh. He's our Lord, he's our savior. But the entire word of God is significant, but this is called a doubly significant passage because here's the thing, it's Jesus who is God in human flesh doing the talking. He's, he's sharing a parable with his disciples. But secondly, he's revealing what God is like. And so we better listen. Let's pick up the reading in verse 11. We call this the parable of the lost son, but I like to call it the parable of the loving father. And today on Valentine's Day, which is when this uh, message is being delivered to you, in your homes for the very first time, I thought we'd read about the love of God for a wayward son. For the truth of the matter is, is that I was a wayward son, lost without hope, but because of Jesus, God made a way for me to be saved. If you're a daughter, if you're a, a female, you are a lost and wayward daughter. But God loved you with such an everlasting love that he would go to the ends of the earth. From heaven and all of its splendor and majesty to the dirt and filth to live with humanity on earth to become the substitute for our sin. To die on a cross to save our souls. Jesus, before his death, is telling the disciples and some religious leaders who don't care too much for Jesus about what God is like. And here's what he says in the parable of the lost son. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of my inheritance, of my estate. And so he divided his property between them. He was a loving father, a very gracious man. Not long after that, the younger son got all together that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living, and after he had spent everything. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need, and so he went and hired himself out as a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. Oh, how he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, Yet no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'm going to set out, go back to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So simply hire me out as a servant. He got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. What was the father doing? Was this um, an opportunity? A chance meeting? No, the father waited there every day to find his son returning home. And one day he did. Filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him and said, son, uh, the son rather said to the father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, quick, Bring the best robe, put it around him. Put a ring on his finger, put new sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it, for today we will have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine who was dead is alive. 
alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. And so they began to celebrate. This passage is an unbelievably beautiful passage of God's love. Not just for a father to his son, but the father to a lost and wayward world. It's not enough just to believe in God, you see, my dear friends. You must understand the nature of God. And Jesus came to introduce us to him. And from this passage, I think we learn a few things about the love and character and nature of God, which is incredibly important because if we're going to take the time and energy and spend our lives believing in and following this God, we must lay a solid foundation if we're ever going to build a life of faith. You can't build a skyscraper on a chicken coop foundation, my dear friends. You've got to have a solid, solid foundation. So what we know and believe about God is eternally important to us. I think this passage reveals a few things. Number one is that God grieves when we sin. It was very clear that it doesn't make God mad. God is bigger than earthly feelings. Is it that it hurts his heart because he knows exactly what is best for us and that sin is never the answer and that for whatever the reason, when we fall away, when we sin, when we wander off, when we like this prodigal son run away and squander our lives on wild living, is it that because God is mad at us? Of course not. God regrets what we have done, of course. I wouldn't dare say it makes him happy, but it grieves him that we didn't believe him. We did not believe God is who he says he is and that he can eternally satisfy our souls. We think we need other things. So we chase after them, whatever they may be. And many of you will say, oh, I haven't squandered my life on wild living. Very well may be true. But what is it that captures your attention more than God? What is it that captures your affection more than the God who sent his son to die to save you and me? Well, the honest answer is probably a lot of things. And that is, my dear friends, the work that still needs to be done in our lives. But first it begins by believing in God. And in believing in God, believing the right things about God, understanding the divine character and nature of God. God regrets our rebellion on several levels. First and foremost, it's because we have not trusted him. The son takes the money and runs, walks out of his father's life and heads for the far country. Exhibit number one of a rebellious, disrespectful child. And clearly this breaks the father's earthly heart. And it's true about God. God is a gentleman. Your sinfulness hinders your relationship to God. God doesn't like to break fellowship with us. He wants us to be in divine fellowship with him. He wants us to enjoy his loving embrace all of the time. But as we walk away from God, God is a gentleman and will let you. We've ever gone to the beach and you get out in the water and you begin to drift with the tides. God is always right where he has always been. But he wants, he desires for us to stay with him. We tend to drift. You see, once you begin a relationship with God, once you, once you become a follower of Jesus, a Christian, you, you establish a relationship. And it's a love relationship between you and God. Rather, God establishes a love relationship between him and you and me. Through Jesus, 
Hebrews, I believe chapters 1, 2, or 3 says, Christ becomes our mediator between us and God. God of the universe loves you so much that He will never force you to stay in fellowship with Him because He doesn't coerce obedience and loyalty from you and me. He doesn't demand it. God doesn't even need it to be complete. God's not codependent upon us. But He wants us to understand the interdependence that we should have on Him, not only in this life, but most importantly, in the next. God didn't stop that young man from leaving his father for the very same reason that he didn't intervene when Adam and Eve began eating the forbidden fruit. Same way he did not stop King David from having his way with Bathsheba. And the list could go on and on in Scripture. <clears throat> All of these great testimonies of these biblical saints are exactly like you and me. They wandered off, we've wandered off, and God waited for our return. He loves you so much, He'll allow you to make your own choices. God is a gentleman. And yes, he regrets our rebellion, not simply because he's perfectly righteous in every way and so it is an offense to him. No, he regrets our rebellion because he knows that can never be best for us. And I hope you'll hear that today. That our sin doesn't make God mad at us, but it is something that God regrets. It grieves the heart of God. And why would we ever want to do that to someone with whom we are in loving relationship. Think on these things today. But secondly, listen to this. God runs when we come home. I love this. This is one of the most beautiful things about this story. The wayward son didn't fare so well in that far country. He lived high on the hog, but pretty soon he was living low with the pigs. Squandered his wealth in wild living, Jesus simply says. Before he could count his money, it was all gone and ended up in a pig pen slopping around with the hogs. Finally reaches his point of desperation and he turns toward home. Scholars have discovered a very similar story in the oral traditions of the Hebrew people. Yet Jesus here in this passage of Scripture is talking to religious leaders and He is talking to His disciples. He's sharing them parables, stories that make a point. The point Jesus is making here is that God is an ever-loving and gracious God. You can never run too far where God cannot find you. You can never run so far that you can, can't return home. You can always return home when it comes to God. I've known people who have made pretty bad mistakes. I've had the privilege of leading prisoners in the sinner's prayer in prison chapels. Many of them for the very first time admitting their mistakes. And oh, they've got a long road ahead of them. There's no question about it. They've got to make restitution with their state or the federal government. They, I'm sure, have to make restitution if they truly want to follow Jesus with the people they have harmed in, in however manner they have harmed them. For some, it will be to admit for the very first time that they took the life of, uh, of that person's loved one. I remember being on the tarmac, um, on, a, on a little bus on the tarmac, going out to our airplane to go to, uh, from uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, down to Arba Minch, e Ethiopia. And we were talking to this very wealthy businessman in Ethiopia, really sharp, wonderful guy. And he said, what are y'all going to do in Arba Minch? And we told him everything, <coughs> which included going to a prison. <clears throat> he said, why in the world would you want to go to a prison? In Arba Minch. 
You're Americans. We said because we believe all people matter to God. He put his head down. I remember him thinking that over. A little strange look on his face. I, I guess you're right. Never thought of it. It's really something we do think of at First Baptist Church. Our two campuses, reaching a community for Christ, like many other churches in our community are, like wherever you are. The churches in your community are thinking of those who are not thought of, are thinking of those who have wandered off and been forgotten by family or friends or mothers or fathers or communities or churches. God loves us with an everlasting love. And when we come home, God runs to us. Now, what's so interesting about this is in Jewish tradition, this story of the prodigal son is much different in its ending than the story Jesus tells. And you can almost see as Jesus begins this story, like a good Jewish rabbi would in telling his pupils about what God is like, you can almost see the the pride and the arrogance well up, that's right. The son wanders off, and when he tries to come home, the father disowns him, throws him back out into the streets. And the righteous religious men take him beyond the city gates and stone him for his rebellion. That's man's tradition, and that's the story that used to be told. That's not the story Jesus tells at all. For the very first time, the religious leaders are hearing what God is really like, who he really is, and what he really believes and how he really feels because before them is God in human form, Jesus telling him, no, there was no disowning and there was no stoning. Jesus said, the father runs to him, puts a robe on his back, puts the signet ring of the family on his finger, gives him a brand new pair of sandals, his servants kill the fattened calf and they celebrate the return of the son. What a shocker. You can almost see the religious elite walking away from Jesus in disgust while all the sinners standing around Jesus are saying, there's hope for me, there's, there's hope for me. And there is, my friend. Without a doubt, Jesus gives this surprise twist to the plot of the story. Freaks the religious leaders out, but it makes perfect sense to the sinner. Jesus said, God runs to meet us when we choose to run home. God didn't walk away from you when you sinned, my friend. You walked away from him. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Old Testament prophets said, we like sheep have all gone astray. Each has turned to his own way and God laid upon him, meaning Christ, the iniquities of us all, the sinfulness of all humanity. No, my dear friends, God is a loving father and if you'll just take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him, and all of your darkness will end, for within your heart he'll abide. The old British pastor Charles Haddon Spurgeon said of this scene, and I love this, he said, it was not with the icy eyes that the father looked on re his returning son. Love filled his heart as he beheld him. There was no anger in his heart toward his son. 
It was true that it was all of his own fault, but that did not come before the father's mind. It was the state that he was in, his poverty, his degradation, that pale face of so wan with hunger that touched his father to the quick. And the father ran. The compassion of God followed by swift movements Slow to anger, quick to bless. God comes flying in the greatness of his compassion to help every poor soul that returns to him. And that's the last thing I want to say, and we'll wrap this up. God restores you when you repent. And it's one of the hardest things to say, is it not? Every true follower of Jesus has said it, though. God, I was wrong. I made the mistake. I made the mess of my life. I wandered off and squandered it all away. Whatever living I was living, it was wrong and I repent and I come home to you, God. God, forgive me. Grant me eternal life. I accept Jesus. His work on the cross, His resurrection from the dead, I believe and I trust. And you too will be saved. You too, one day, will be welcomed home. An eternal road, the signet ring of God Himself. The Bible calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb, a huge celebration as all God's people finally make it home. It's time to celebrate. Have you wandered away from God? Are you willing to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I I want to come home. Are you willing to return to him? In his book, Capital of the World, Ernest Hemingway wrote about a father in Spain who had a son named Paco. They had an extremely uh, difficult relationship, one that was fueled by the son's alcohol. It was a horrible thing, lots of bitterness, lots of anger. Finally, the son is kicked out. And after years of bitterness, the father's anger subsided, realized he'd made a huge mistake, and so he began to look for Paco, and he looked everywhere, and he could not find his son, so he decides to take out an ad in the newspaper. A simple ad that says, Paco, my son, all is forgiven and forgotten. Come home. And told him where to meet him on a certain day at a certain place, a certain time of the week. As Hemingway writes, 600 young men named Paco were standing in that city square hoping waiting to see their father, bringing with him his forgiveness. I'm not sure that every broken relationship in this life can be restored, and the reason why is it takes the one willing to forgive and the one willing to receive. That's a tall order. But this promise I make, not on what I understand, not what I've been preaching about for 30 plus years, not what I believe to be true, but what I know is true because of God's divinely inspired truth, His Word. If you'll come home to God and ask Him to forgive you, all will be forgiven and forgotten. You'll not only begin to restore a lost relationship, but you'll begin to receive God's love and grace once again, and there's nothing like it. And we pray for you today. We hope that as we think on some of these things, next week we're going to be talking about the value of life. 
the lost value of life at times. The week after, we're going to be talking about living out those truths we claim to believe and how we can do that. But today, on this Valentine's Day, we just wanted to say, God loves you with an everlasting love. In fact, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him would never perish but have everlasting life. We love you. We're so glad you joined us. Most importantly, God loves you, friend. God bless. We want to thank you for joining us for worship on this Valentine's Day this morning at First Baptist Church. We know we're singing about love. We've talked about love. We've prayed about love. Let's sing one more chorus. I could sing of that love, and we will forever. Let's sing it. I could sing of your love.